Hi, I'm Rebecca Balcarcel. Let's talk about Emily Dickinson's poem, Some Things That Fly There Be. She starts out with three lines in one stanza, beginning this way. Some things that fly there be, birds, ours, the bumblebee, of these no elegy. So she starts out by saying that there are some things that fly. And line two lists three things that do fly, birds, ours, and bumblebees. So ours flying is a bit figurative, while birds and bumblebees are literal, they actually fly. And then the last line says, of these, so of these three things, there's no elegy. She's not going to write an elegy. An elegy is a lament, a sad, melancholy poem. Sometimes it's a tribute kind of poem. But she says, no, that's not what I'm going to write. I'm not going to write an elegy to things that fly, like birds or bees or ours. Stanza two is also three lines long and also contains a list of three things. It starts out, some things that stay there be, grief, hills, eternity, nor this behooveth me. So she starts out saying some things do stay. So there are some things that stay. In the previous stanza, she talked about things that fly. So now we contrast that with things that stay. And she gives three examples. Uh, grief, grief stays. So this is a somber note to the poem, a, a tone that's rather serious, because she's saying grief stays. She's not talking about, you know, happiness staying. She's talking about grief that stays. So when you lose someone, that feeling of grief stays with you. So grief stays, hills stay. At least in a human lifetime, a hill is a static thing that stays. Eternity stays. She thinks of eternity as a permanent thing that stays. Okay, so that's her three things that stay. And then she ends with, nor this behooveth me. Now, this is a confusing line, but it means that she's not going to write a poem about these things either. So there's not going to be an elegy about things that fly, and there's not going to be a poem about things that stay either. She says, these don't serve me. Behooveth means serve. These don't fit the bill. These are not things that I want to write about. They're not suitable subjects for me, or not this time anyway. And then the third stanza. Now this is a third stanza and it's got three lines also. So we have nine lines all together. And the threes and the nines, especially the repetition of three, lists of three, appropriately makes people think of the Trinity or just the fact that the number three is kind of a mystical number in a lot of religions of the world, not only Christianity. But Dickinson comes from a Christian tradition, so it's appropriate to think of the Trinity in the idea that God is actually three parts, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In other traditions we might have like creator, destroyer, uh, sustainer, something like that. So three has a religious element to it. Now this third stanza though does not have that list of three that the other two do. She says, there are that resting rise. How can I expound the skies? How still the riddle lies. Sorry for that flub there. So line one is, there are that resting, comma, rise. So there are things that rest that then turn out to rise. Now what are those things? Really, she can only be referring to the bodies of people who have died who are now resting, bodies resting in coffins under the ground. So they're resting, but at the same time they rise. So the spirit rises, the soul leaves the body. That's what the rising means. Now the second line is, can I expound the skies? So now she's saying, okay, can I write about that? Can I explain that in words? Can I capture the soul, spirit, reality in a poem? No, it's very hard to capture. So previously she talked about an elegy. She's not going to write that, an, a lament. Then she said, I'm not going to write about grief and hills and eternity either. But now she's saying, can I expound the skies where the resting people rise, you know, where their spirits go or whatever? Um, maybe. But then the last line answers the question, how still the riddle lies. 
So it's as if she's saying, no, I really can't capture it in words. It's a riddle, how still it lies, how permanently the question of life and death sits there. The poem is not going to be able to expound, explain, praise, make a speech about life and death. The poet's not going to succeed in that. So she says it's like a riddle, like a puzzle, and it lies there still, the same as the people in their coffins are lying still. Now, some people have pointed out that maybe the word riddle refers to the poem itself, as if the poem is a riddle. But I don't find the poem really that cryptic. Um, to me, it's more likely that this word riddle does refer to the riddle of the soul and the spirit and, and the relationship between those and the body and what exactly happens when the rising occurs. That seems to be the riddle that she's talking about and that it's difficult to explain the riddle in a poem or in any form at all. It's it's a unchanging question mystery. Well, that's my take on the poem. I hope this helps you understand it a little bit. And maybe you'll have ideas of your own to put in the comments. That'd be great. Hope you'll join me for another video sometime.